Th thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for being here. Uh, I want to apologize to the team. They've probably done a better job designing the presentation than I'll do presenting it, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, so what are DAOs? Uh, well, we believe that DAOs are the next step in evolution of human coordination, uh, which is a bit of a bold statement, but bear with me for, for the time being. Um, so why? Let, let's start with why, and let's, let's, let's look at how are people coordinating today. Um, money, and that, that means both debt and cash, so the concept of money is one of the most fundamental primitives that enabled the, the emergence of, of human society together with, with you know, the, the elaborate speech uh, that we can use to express um, desires. Uh, basically, without money, there would have been no out-of-kin altruism, um, which means that you know, we, would have st we would still be in bands of whatever family size of, 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 or a pack we have. And a lot of the ways that we currently coordinate are layers of complexity and abstractions built on top of that through like the financial system and legal contracts and, 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 and constitutions of, of, of different countries and all of that stuff. Uh, and we believe that blockchain based systems can, can drastically decrease the, the, the cost of coordination by lowering those, those friction, co uh, friction points, uh, making it easier to transact without the need for these layers of abstraction on top. Um, so um, what is actually a DAO? Uh, there are like a thousand uh, <laughs> different definitions. It means everything and nothing. Uh, literally yesterday there was like a paper around how do we formalize the definition of a DAO, but um, the concept is pretty new, so having a definition that, that can be used universally is probably close to impossible at this point, uh, but we are going to think of it as uh, having three core pillars, community, treasury, and coordination. Um, this can obviously be abstracted away. Uh, community can be any set of agents. It doesn't mean to be like physical individuals. Community can be different organizations or even potentially in the future, you know, AIs can be members of a community. Uh, and treasury can mean any sort of asset, whether it's financial or otherwise, whether it's on-chain or off-chain. And then coordination is the infrastructure and the technology that we at Aragon are building, and like there are a lot of really cool and, and strong teams in the space that are focused on creating coordination technology. Um, how does how, how are DAOs looking today? So uh, <laughs> we have to update the numbers since February because they drastically changed, uh, as we all know. Um, but there are about seven and a half billion. Uh, dollars of value that are being currently governed by organizations that have been classified as DAOs. Some of those are DAOs in just name. Others are further down the decentralization spectrum. Um, and it's a tiny market at this point. It's, it's less than 5,000 organizations. About 1,000 of them have more than 1 million in treasury. Uh, I think the coolest part of this slide is the fact that DAOs are currently trading at over 85% discount, uh, which basically means everybody thinks we'll fail, right? Like, there is a lot of value to be unlocked by coordinating better, and the market is betting against us, which is a, a good position to be in. Like, it's, it's hard to disappoint when everybody expects you to fail, which is my approach to this presentation as well. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so why blockchain? What are, what are the characteristics of the technology that uh, are giving us confidence to make bold claims that will change the way people, people interact and coordinate. Um, there is substantially higher, and that, that's my personal, like, m for me that's the most important one, personally. There is a substantially higher flex flexibility in incentive designs. So, so you, can, you can make a, a, more, a much more equitable distribution of decision-making power and economic upside across contributors to a certain common enterprise. Uh, and you can make that incentive set evolve as the organization changes and its needs change and like different agents contribute to that network in different ways over time. So that flexibility is something that currently takes 
hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and a lot of lawyers and, and financiers, and there you can just have a lot of that baked into smart contracts. Uh, we are working with digitally native unstoppable organizations. Anyone, anywhere in the world with an internet connection can launch a DAO. It's becoming increasingly difficult for anyone internal to the DAO or external to change the rules of the game. Like you can't really censor specific members, etc. cetera. Uh, there are massive upsides to this. There are some potential risks. We'll talk about it later. But overall, it's a very powerful primitive for, for designing uh, common endeavors. And the combination of transparency and privacy makes this extremely uh, powerful. A, having a public ledger uh, is a much better basis for creating a transparency first world. And, um, and there are a lot of things that people don't really have to have, don't really want to have on chain, uh, both people and organizations. And that's when the, the, the zero knowledge technology comes into play. Uh, there are a few teams here that are doing really cool stuff in that direction. But basically, that would enable putting all this private information on chain. So at a future point in time, you know, if there is a need for an audit, right? You can, like, no, no company can be like, oh, we don't want to put our data on chain because, you know, competitors are going to see it. That argument disappears, and that, that would dramatically increase the, the, decrease, actually, the cost of adoption. Um, so, you know, having those three things in mind, um, I'm going to get back to what are DAOs now? So we know that there is like 7.5 billion held by DAOs. There are about 5,000 organizations. What, what are the current use cases? Uh, so broadly, capital collectives. Uh, we can see that as investment collectives and donation collectives. You know, speaking broadly, uh, the two examples are Unchained Fund, which was formed in February to relieve uh, some of the atrocities happening in Ukraine after the invasion. Uh, they have, to date, distributed about $9 million directly to people on the ground. Uh, and like the, the, the rate, the, so <laughs> basically all the money that was donated has been distributed to actual people that are suffering, right? It, like there is no structure in between, there are no administrators, uh, which is a, a pretty cool <laughs> development in, in, in the space of, of um, uh, donations. Uh, on, the, on the investment side, this is the logo of Metacritical Venture, which is one of the most prolific Web3 native capital allocators. Uh, check them out to find out more. But basically, the, 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 the idea of this slide is coordinating around on-chain financial capital is really easy with a DAO because that's the first and lowest hanging fruit as a use case. Um, work collectives. So as, as, as I mentioned earlier, capital doesn't need to be financial. And in the case of a work collective, we're talking about human capital or cultural capital. Um, so uh, there are two, two examples. One of them is the Play to Earn guilds. Uh, and there are questions around the, the, the financial and economic sustainability of the Play to Earn business model. But that taken aside, the fact that you can have communities coordinating around collectively exploiting a market opportunity is a really powerful uh, design pattern that can be later on implemented in other sectors of the economy. Uh, Raid Guild is a good example of that. They are uh, like one of the, the higher profile service DAOs, and basically it's a service provider cooperative where um, both the, the work and the benefit are being distributed in a way that every contributor uh, that every contributor has a voice in how the organization moves forward, how are rewards distributed, which projects are being taken, who works on each project, etc. cetera. Um, one, 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 one other vertical is product and protocol DAOs. And that's, those are like the biggest guys in the room. Those are the projects that have substantial, uh, enjoyed substantial capital interest and 
they have the biggest treasuries, the most complex organizational structures. Uh, and that's one of the cool things about DAOs. Like, there's a lot of money on the line, and we're experimenting. Uh, so a lot of the academic theory of how people organize, how people behave, like, it is being tested. It's being experimented, and it's not like I'm going to pay $20 to... Uh, a university educated mostly western person to tell me how they would act we have people and both people that want the best for the protocol and people that want to exploit the protocol competing in decision making in order to push the organization forward or bankrupt it uh, and that tells us a lot about how people think and act uh, maker Probably one of the one of one of the most mature organizations that is a DAO today, or the furthest the, down the decentralization timeline, uh, and it's 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 truly fascinating because you can see a lot of a lot of the decision making happening in real time. Obviously, there is stuff that is 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 not fully transparent, and but that's that's only natural. Um, wait. Last but not least, we spoke about NFTs, so we cannot, we cannot move forward b without uh, the sports and overall entertainment angle of things. Uh, two examples here, it's uh, Krauss House, which is a bunch of basketball fans that have decided, let's, let's coordinate around raising funds so we can buy and own a basketball team, an, an NBA team. Uh, I don't know how, how, <laughs> how far along the, the way they are, but the, the organization has been evolving and has been raising both financial and human capital towards that goal in a somewhat sustainable way. And like the, the, the most high profile example is usually Constitution DAO, but like that was something that money was raised, nothing happened, speculators took over. <laughs> and I don't think it's a good example that we would want to aspire towards. But, but these guys are doing something uh, consistently and persistently, and I, I hope they'll succeed at one point. Uh, the other exa example is digital experiences. Um, Pac is an artist or group of artists, we don't know, uh, that has created one of the most popular um, image curation AI in the world. It's called... Uh, an anarchist on Twitter, they, they do cool stuff. Uh, but he's also done a lot of uh, on-chain projects that tie entertainment and digital art. And members of the community can uh, alter some of the parameters of the games and the projects as they evolve. And sooner or later, a lot of, a lot of the PFPs are going to either move towards that direction of a community that creates some sort of value, more often entertainment than not, just because of the, the, the predominant um, set of skills available in that segment, or they will die off. OK, so, so we, we looked at, oh shit, OK. Uh, <laughs> we looked at uh, what has been happening today. Uh, let's let's take a look at what what uh, what could be happening in the future. Uh, Community-centric businesses are, are completely like it's a no-brainer. Every loyalty program on the planet can be tokenized, bringing liquidity and some decision-making power to the loyal brand followers. Uh, and another 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 good example here is. We call them social networks, but it's not a network, right? It's like one company in the middle, and they have advertisers on one side and consumers on the other, and, and it's, it's, it's a company in the middle. So having uh, an equitable distribution of ownership in such a network ultimately should result in more sustainable incentives and balance of value between people that are selling something and people that take non-monetary benefits from that network. Uh, the future of work and labor. We've we've seen we've seen uh, the digital revolution enable a lot of people to from from lower cost destinations to be liberated and to be able to pursue more rewarding, both um, 
economically and otherwise careers around the globe. And currently, a lot of that value is extracted by outsourcing companies. We believe DAOs as forms of self-organization, the example of service guilds, can disintermediate that and, and bring more equality to the world. Uh, consortia networks around shared infrastructure assets. I think that's, that's really interesting in terms of like, this is a low hanging fruit for the real world. Uh, any nature preservation effort can be mapped to a set of stakeholders that have their own incentives and motivations, and then you can, you can use blockchain-based rules to bring more transparency and permanence into the rules of engagement of how each stakeholder can interact with the asset. And you, know, you have nature preservation. On the flip side, you can have like literally natural gas pipelines being governed by a consortia through on-chain coordination. Uh, this is cool. Uh, <laughs> so there are already experiments around communities uh, creating physical world spaces that are governed as DAOs. But you know, taking those experiments one step further, uh, Balaji wrote a book called The Network State about digitally native, fully distributed, country. And it sounds a bit wild today. I think in the next two years it's impossible to happen, but in the next 20 it's inevitable. It will be happening. One way or another, we will experience that. It might be a failed experiment, it might be a success. So, there is the state of today, there is a state of tomorrow, and like, why are we not there? So, I mean, the obvious one is that the, the technology kind of sucks on the, on the, on the, on the, on the interaction level, right? Like everything that's not directly related to speculation has usually terrible user experience. And people would often prefer convenience over sovereignty. So that relates to improving the tech and improving education. Being in Brussels, we, <laughs> we cannot not talk about regulation. Uh, so segue into that is that bad apples are inevitable. So it's a disruptive new technology. At some point in the future, there's gonna be an organization or people leveraging that technology to cause pain in the real world. Like, it's inevitable. The point is, how would media, the industry, and regulators react to that? Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's an open question, right? Like, we don't know what the right reaction is. Uh, Over-regulation, for sure, is not the right way. Uh, we've, we, we've seen again and again regulators trying to um, step in and regulate technologies that they understand very poorly. That's, that's in, in, a, in a global competitive landscape, that would just result in regulatory arbitrage. And if Europe, the European Union gets overly aggressive, they'll just lose talent and capital to other jurisdictions. Um, to make it even a bit more specific, the concept of having decision-making power and shared economic upside into endeavors to which someone is contributing, it's hugely liberating on a personal level. Getting paid in equity, in essence, right? But because the SEC might be listening, we call it governance tokens, uh, we don't get dividends, and we're stifling innovation and adoption based on a regulation that was conceptualized 100 years ago. This, like, like enabling uh, organizations to call this equity, because it already is equity, it's just the, the concept, it's not the financial instrument, but that could be a massive unlock of economic value and innovation around the world. Thank you.